welcome back to Meraki Unboxed. My name is Simon Thompson, your host for today. Thanks very much for joining us once again on the podcast that we run every two weeks, focused around all of the technology and people and, of course, the partners and customers that make Meraki tick. We also love to, topic, to touch on the topics of the day, and uh, we've already done an episode on sustainability, a really good one, actually, where there was some very useful um, sort of background information to help educate on the importance of this general topic area. Today, what we're going to do is just sharpen the focus a little bit more on one specific area where we believe we can make a difference. That's the purpose of our episode. Before we get into that, I just want to remind you how much we love to have your participation in the creation of these podcast episodes. So if you have an idea for an episode or you would even like to be on the show, I would love to hear from you. Best way to reach me is via Twitter and you can find me there with a the handle at Meraki Simon. Please ping me there. I'm there every single day and I would love to hear from you and let's get you involved in Meraki Unboxed. Today, I'm actually going to be introducing uh, three of my colleagues here at Meraki uh, who are going to help take us through the conversation today. Uh, so let's start with that and then we'll get into the topic of the day. So uh, on my screen, I see in front of me, David. Good morning, David. Good morning, Simon. Uh, thanks for having me today. And David, what do you do for Meraki? Yeah, I work as a product marketing manager for our IoT portfolio of products, particularly our IoT sensors. And we will certainly be back to talk about those again very soon. Uh, moving on, I see Leo. Leo is over in the UK, right, Leo? And that's right. So I'm not really sure if I can say good morning, Simon. I good guess afternoon. more appropriate. <laughs> good afternoon. Uh, nearly, nearly the evening for, for me. Yeah. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Leo. So I'm looking after the IoT uh, portfolio for Meraki. So MV and MT as well. And I have the chance to actually discuss with lots of customers uh, all around different countries. So really looking forward to discuss this in more details with mm. you. Yes, absolutely. And, and I know that uh, obviously we've had some great involvement both with our own technology and the use of it in our own spaces. That's really what we want to bring in as well as talking about external customers who are doing the same thing. Uh, so that leads me to uh, our last guest today, Joe. Welcome, Joe. Hey, Simon. It's great to be here. Hi, everyone. I'm Joe Weiss. I look after our global sales team for our smart cameras and sensor products here at Meraki. Um, and I'm excited to spend a little time with you sharing some of how some of our customers are starting to use our Meraki technology to drive their sustainability initiatives. Uh, it's a very, very exciting and, and new cutting edge technology, and we're happy to be here sharing it with you. Yep, couldn't agree more. And I think this is really interesting that we are uh, fundamentally a networking, we th we've always thought of ourselves as a networking company historically, but we're clearly moving past that. And we have now other products in our portfolio that really move us into being able to open up different kinds of conversations. And that's what's led us really to this place today. Sometimes we're talking about smart spaces with, uh, with cameras, uh, and sometimes we're talking about this sustainability topic. And that's, that's very much our, our focus for today. Uh, so, Joe, tell us a little bit about how you see data centers today. I mean, to me, I'm, I'm actually kind of surprised that we still talk about data centers because I've been using cloud services for well over a decade at this point in time. I think we all do every single day. So why are they still even a thing? Yeah, you know, it comes up an awful lot when people come to me and they say, well, Joe, why are you even talking about data centers? And the reality is, is because everybody has them, whether we call them data centers or comms rooms or network closets or that cupboard where you stuff the routers and switches and forget about them. Uh, and, you know, as we started to work with our customers in this space, when we launched our sensor portfolio, it was all around protecting their investment. Because we had an issue at Meraki when we had an outage in our offices and when we went to go leverage the sensors we put in, but we found out how complicated and difficult things really were for our customers because we were having these issues. And at Meraki, when we see a problem in our own organization, the onus is on us to go out there and fix that for our customers. And so when we started to look at how we would protect the investments we make into our network technology, turned out our customers had the same challenges that we had. And so when we talk about these spaces, it's not these cavernous halls of data centers that you expect from the movies. And, you know, the reality is like 
Sure, sometimes that is the case, but for a majority of our customers, the data center is really those 18 to 24 racks of equipment that are in the basement of their campuses or branches that run their buildings where their yeah. access control and their video surveillance and their networking equipment all terminates where the most vital part of their organization that drives their IT infrastructure is at. And so it's not always about these big cavernous halls that customers think of. You know, our customers are trying to solve problems, not just in their campuses and branches, but sometimes in historic buildings and where they're really challenged to be able to run new infrastructure. So it's a, it's a big topic and maybe a lot bigger than most customers actually think about because, you know, when they see that this is about data center, they might want to say, mm, not for me, but it turns out everyone's got some network equipment. Right. That makes perfect sense. You've still got to have that sort of last mile or, or whatever you, you choose to call that, right? You've still got your own infrastructure to take care of. You've actually just reminded me, um, kind of random, but uh, it is Wednesday when this podcast typically goes out. And uh, uh, you've reminded me of the hashtag Cable Wednesday. Uh, have you seen that one with the, um, with the sort of beautifully architected... Uh, you know, cabling running around the building, Cat 5, Cat 6, whatever it is, Cat 7 these days. Good stuff. Yeah, I can never get the cables to line up like they do. <laughs> that is, uh, I'm just not that handy. It's special. Um, okay. I have, All right, so I have seen very few places. I have seen very few places like this. Uh, so, yeah, interesting to see this a bit more. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yes, we would love to see that. Um, Share, send in your picks, folks. Um, hashtag Cable Wednesday, hashtag Meraki. Um, okay, so David, um, I would love to um, just sort of take a step back a little bit. So if we accept that we are all running a data center of some description because we've all got to provide that last mile uh, to you know the local area network, then let's think about um, sustainability and the sort of broader topic. Maybe you could give us a little bit of a, a sense of why that is so important. Sure, sure, yeah. So... Sustainability is obviously a topic that is top of everyone's mind today. Everyone is looking to become carbon neutral. They are trying to remove uh, CO2 emissions from the environment. They want to reduce energy costs to keep you know lower costs. They want to become more green to attract top talent. And there's a lot of really good reasons for organizations to try to become more sustainable and make a better world for tomorrow. And the problem that we saw was that a lot of organizations, they were really struggling to figure out, well, how do I get started with sustainability? Where do I start? Where can I have the greatest impact? When you start looking at things like circular economy and sustainable packaging and net zero emissions, and you know, there's a lot of different ways that organizations can approach sustainability. Um, however, we found that there was a uh, a really, really tangible way for organizations to become more sustainable by looking inside of their data centers. Mm -hmm. So as Joe mentioned, we a lot of our customers, they have that infrastructure in their campuses, in their branches. And at Meraki, a lot of our products go into those environments. And so we ended up creating a portfolio of IoT sensors to help support the products that are in those environments. You know, they have to uh, make sure that they are monitoring temperature in there. They got to make sure that the HVAC system isn't leaking condensation on this equipment to keep their uh, equipment up and running. They want to make sure that people aren't going in there unauthorized and tampering with the equipment. And so as we started to deploy some of our sensors in these environments, we saw that a lot of times these environments are not designed in a sustainable way. Sure, when you look at Amazon and Google and Facebook and all of these modern day data centers, they are built to perfection. They are 100% sustainable. But the reality is for most organizations, they acquired a building that was 50 years old, that hasn't been renovated in many years. Um, they don't have proper HVAC systems in place. They aren't leveraging technologies like free air cooling, where they're actually pulling in air from the outside to cool the data center. And so we realized that there was a really good opportunity to help these customers um, become more sustainable by trying to optimize the environments that they, they were given, that they are working with today. Um, and there's a lot of good best practices that they, we found that they are able to implement um, just given the constraints that they have in order to become more sustainable um, in those environments. Mm. 
That's that, I mean that's very helpful in framing this conversation just generally. I think um, let's let's just recap on what it is that we have in the kit bag at Meraki that that uh, that really helps with this. So you did touch on that, but I, I want to get specific. So talk about the the actual products themselves and what it is that they bring to the table. Yeah, uh, great question. So uh, in our sensor portfolio today, we have four IoT sensors. So we have um, a temperature and humidity sensor. We have a temperature probe sensor, which is made for more of the cold storage environments, refrigerators and freezers. Um, we have a water leak detection sensor, and we have the uh, a door open and close sensor. So the portfolio was initially designed around protecting business critical infrastructure, all of your IT equipment. So all of these data centers, server rooms, comms rooms, they have to make sure that the environmentals are appropriate for the equipment in that space. If the HVAC system fails and the equipment starts to overheat, then all of a sudden it can cause a server to crash. It can cause the network to go down. Mm -hmm. um, if there is a leaky window in the space or the, one of the facilities pipes ends up bursting, uh, that water can get into the space and it can ruin that equipment. And not only does replacing the equipment carry a significant monetary cost, but more importantly, it's, it's the downtime that that those events can cost to that equipment that can really disrupt an organization. For example, think of a retailer. If their network goes down, they cannot transact with their customers. Their POS, system, their POS systems connect to the network. They need access to the network in order to, to be able to make those transactions. And so it's very vital for organizations to keep it up and running. Um, I've actually seen stats that the average cost of network downtime is over $400,000 or more per hour. Um, so it's very, very significant. And that's kind of how we, you know, the reasons we designed the, the empty sensor portfolio initially. Yeah, when you put it like that, that's that's going to get people's attention for sure. And uh, I think it's very interesting. You, um, the way that you put that, it does remind me that, of course, there are two things at play here. Which uh, you know, there is that sort of indirect doing the right thing for the planet around sustainability, just doing the right thing generally. Um, but also there is a real hard dollar value attached to this kind of behavior. And you know, getting these things right can make a significant difference to uh, to the bottom line for, for any business. So it is worth looking at whichever perspective you prefer to start with. I think ultimately we are here to talk about the, how we can make a difference to you know the environmental performance of, of these environments, but, but it has that great knock-on effect, of course. Of, uh, of improving the cost base for the for the business. Let's let's actually try and think about how we apply this to uh, the real world. So um, this Leo, let's bring you in here. I want to hear about what we've done at Meraki with our own stuff to uh, to actually try and bring this to life and realize some of these benefits. Yeah, absolutely, uh, absolutely, Simon. Uh, and I think that's a big drive uh, at Cisco to do. Also, our bit. Uh, you can just imagine. I think you, you mentioned that uh, uh, already. Cisco is just a, a large networking uh, company that actually has lots of offices, lots of data centers, lots of labs. Huh? Some of the audience might do a CCIE. Uh, just mm -hmm. check a little bit the amount of gear that you have in those labs uh, all around all around the world. And and I think what was really interesting when we actually started, and and we is more like a stumble more than anything <laughs> else is that when we start discussing uh, internally, you know, with the individual that were responsible of maintaining those data centers, the first thing, you know, I always remember, you know, the expression of the face, whereas they told me it's wireless, it's Bluetooth, you don't need a server or a gateway to get the temperature. I said, yes, you just, you know, as long as you have an AP, a Meraki AP or a camera, uh, a Meraki camera, yeah, automatically you have good the gateway, you don't need an extra device. And they actually, you know, I exaggerate, but they were about to hug me. I said, this is just amazing because what they were explaining to me is that, you know, just for me to get temperature at every single rack, you know, at the front and at the back, I actually need to have a server in there in order to be the gateway. That server alone already cost me $5,000 on average, depending of where you are, in electricity just to be there. Right. So by removing this, you can already imagine the, the amount of saving that you will be making for that. And the fact that it's actually Bluetooth, where you can actually deploy it very easily, you can actually start peppering all those MT, the temperature MT, very easily in the data center. And getting the data was extremely something very, very useful. So it's like kind of a twofold, not only 
we remove extra devices that don't need to be there that consume a lot of electricity. And second, you also have real time data because everything is like an API first. And the problems that I had with a more traditional, you're just getting hold of that data. You know, do you actually have the right software on that laptop? Do you actually have the right access? Uh, do you automate those alert when actually need to be? It was very complicated. The fact that you know you can just extract this API, this information via API, it was extremely useful, mm -hmm. and and that visibility, and it felt like you're in control of that temperature uh, of this. So we started at Bedford here in London, but we we already start spreading this out across all the labs. So for all, all our audience that are doing any any labs uh, uh, within Cisco, well, they have been you know monitored using MT, making sure that those old uh, building, like David, you're absolutely right. How many buildings haven't really been designed uh, to actually host networking gear? So we already started you know, in, in, in the US, in Italy, in France, uh, here in the UK, where we now provide this. And some of the really cool results that we actually have is just a reduction of energy. You know, uh, David, you mentioned Fahrenheit. I don't really understand that measurement. <laughs> so we talk it's <laughs> degrees Celsius. But one degree Celsius, yeah, is about 8, 10% electricity. And we are in 2022. That will probably rise, you know, in the next few months. So having that visibility was extremely great. And, and we're helping Cisco as well to just to be more than sustainable environment to work for. I, I want to, I mean, there was a lot in that answer there earlier. I want to just unpack it a little bit. Um, Bedfont Lakes, tell us a little bit about paint a picture. What, is, what does Bedfont Lakes look like from a data center perspective? This is one of the major data centers for Cisco in Europe, right? Yeah, absolutely. And 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 I would say it's probably a top-notch data center, you know, modern building, you know, that has all the, the whistles and the balls, you know, to make it very assembled. So we have about 20 racks in these uh, data centers. You know, we actually set three MTs at the front of it. It has a cooling unit uh, that actually doesn't really, uh, uh, doesn't really, connect with the outside world and the UK obviously has still very cold winter and quite really warm summer now, <laughs> uh, but the, this is not, not connected. Uh, and so what we actually were able to do now is that with the data that was coming, you know, constantly, we were actually able to regulate the fan speed. We were making sure also with something that they were not able to do before to make sure that the temperature is the same across all the racks, especially where you are pushing that cold air in front of the rack, making sure that every server across this received the same level of temperature. And that was actually a, a big a big achievement. Um, we have managed to actually reduce the electricity bill but within the, the bigger, the wider building itself. Uh, but the idea is that we managed to start reducing you know, the electricity use here. Mm. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think of any data center that hasn't been through this process as essentially like almost you can think of it like a legacy data center. It's like a traditional uh, way of doing things, and and David, I know that uh, you know you had some thoughts around you know best practices for getting those legacy data centers out of that that world, and it sounds like some of that has absolutely been happening at Bedfont Lakes, and we'll hear that other case study in a minute. I mean, do you want to share some of those best practices uh, that you've established at a more generic level to sort for for others who are thinking about the same kind of project? Yeah, sure. So there's a couple of different ways that organizations can really try to increase the sustainability inside their data center um, for very minimal cost and effort. So um, as a best practice, it's always good to have the rack set up in a hot owl containment system. So have uh, cold air, cold supply air on one side, and then have hot uh, exhaust air in the back of the rack, which mm -hmm. goes up into the ceiling and the hot and the cold air are not able to mix. So that is a really good best practice. Now, if you don't have the ability to completely redesign your, your data center and build a state-of-the-art hot out containment system, you can use just plastic curtains um, that you would see in say like a grocery store in the kind of the meat section or something. And those can kind of serve as a makeshift hot out containment system. Um, I've seen organizations just deploy those and they've reduced their energy costs by like 10 to 30% for a very low cost. Um, so that's one for sure. Another one is this concept called free air cooling. So using a machine called an economizer to either pull in naturally cool air or water from the external environment and use that to cool your data center and humidify your data center. So 
uh, mechanical cooling and mechanical refrigeration is extremely energy intensive. So if you can use naturally cool air or water to regulate the environment inside the data center, you're looking at substantial savings in terms of energy costs. Um, so those are kind of two main ones. A, um, an industry standard that organizations can follow is uh, called ASHRAE. So ASHRAE is the American Society of Heating, Refrigeration, and Air Conditioning Engineers. And through years of research, um, they were able to determine what the temperature and humidity ranges that uh, specific data center equipment can safely operate in without decreasing the, the uptime or the, the reliability of it. And so just by following the ASHRAE guidelines, um, you can kind of effectively increase the temperature of your data center, depending on what your standard was before, um, without decreasing the reliability of the equipment. So a lot of times, a lot of these legacy data centers are overcooled. Mm -hmm. um, it's generally best practice to overcool the room because you want to make sure that that network is not going to go down. However, ASHRAE says, well, actually, if you follow our guidelines, you can safely increase the temperature of your data center without decreasing that reliability. And as I mentioned, just increasing it by one degree can lead to at least four to five percent savings in energy costs. You're actually reminding me of uh, this is just a little bit of an aside, but it's talking about raising the temperature to get more efficiency. Uh, you're making me think of uh, many trade shows that I've been to. Anybody who's ever been to a trade show or just visited a trade show uh, and some of the extent to which they are air conditioned like crazy and we're all standing around shivering and it's and it's like, you know, 100 degrees outside or 40 degrees or whatever it is in Celsius. Um, trying to keep things balanced here, folks. Uh, yes, the, the, there's no doubt about it. The uh, We do have a tendency to over rotate on this called a cooling. And so... Uh, it's really, I mean, it's interesting that that's uh, an interesting perspective. And I imagine many of us have not really thought about that uh, and just tend to assume that cooler equals better. Uh, not always the case. Definitely yeah, not. Fact, what, what's Simon, the... Simon, what I was going to say is with uh, when I talked to our customers about this, we, we went down this road and I started asking the question like, hey, what what temperature do you keep your spaces at where your network equipment lives? Mm -hmm. And I'd ask 10 different customers and get 10 different answers. Right. And you have like the most conservative who says, well, we can't keep our stuff any warmer than 18 or 65, depending on where you're at. So we keep it hyper cooled for reliability. <laughs> and then I'd get others that said, well, you know, it's a hundred year old building and I can't really do much about the cupboard that the stuff lives in. So I just let it run. And, and to David's point, that's that's why Ashray. I worked with the hyperscalers, so Microsoft, Google, Amazon, as they were developing their large scale data centers because they asked the question, what's the right temperature, mm. right? And when they got 10 different answers, they said, well, surely there has to be a standard for this and there, and there wasn't. And so that's, that for me was like the light bulb moment was we've just been doing things the way we've always done them because that what that's what's worked. Yep. But nobody has taken the time to go, well, actually, is that the most efficient way? Is that the best practice? Is that how we should be doing things with all of this new knowledge that we have today? Right. And that that is the essence of um, where you start with sustainability, I think. It's, it's a question, some of the, the things which you maybe haven't even thought about up to this point and how they can – how they can operate more efficiently. So uh, yes, that makes perfect sense. Um, Joe, while we've got you uh, on the mic, I really want to bring in this kind of, uh, external customer. I know we have a large customer who's sort of chosen to go down this pathway and sort of walked this this uh, this path that we're all talking about right now on this uh, on this podcast episode. To tell us the story. Yeah. So it actually just happened a bit by accident. Um, I was working with this extremely large media and advertising company, and um, they had a need to improve their physical security at their campuses and branch sites. And so we were talking to them about the Meraki smart cameras because they you know, could they work when they plug them in and they scale across all of their organization. And it made a lot of sense for them. 
And so they decided that Meraki smart cameras were going to be the way forward for all of their campus security, which was great. And the solution architect that was leading the project said, hey, Joe, I just noticed you guys launched these new Meraki things sensors. And I was, I said, yeah, they're great. People, people love them. And then to David's point, he asked me this question that I thought was a little strange, or maybe it was Leo who said this, which is, are they really battery powered? And I said, well, yeah, of course they are. And he said, and do they really work like you say they'll work? And I'm like, come on, man, it's Meraki. Of course they work like <laughs> we say they're going to work. Right. He goes, so you just push the button and then I, you get the data in the cloud. That's it. I said, well, you're going to need your camera or access point within range of the sensor. But of course, that's that's how they're designed to work. Why are you asking me all these questions? And he's like, we are about to spend a ton of money on sustainability right now with, with a really clunky and really challenging solution to deploy across our campuses. Mm. Tell me more. So... So we've got a problem where our buildings aren't purpose built. And so our comms rooms and data centers are incredibly inefficient. And so we want to go down this road of making them more efficient and adhering to ASHRAE standards. And this is the first time I had heard of ASHRAE. And so I was like, tell me more about this. And he told me about how they've developed a standard and that this was a way that they were going to reduce more than 30% of their electric use in their campuses from IT. And I said, well, sounds great. Count me in. Sounds like a lot of sensors. We love that. <laughs> and so uh, I said, but why? Why Meraki? Like, you, you've been looking at this project now for two years. We just made this product out of thin air a few weeks ago. And now you're already interested in making the move over. And he's like, well... He goes, I'm going to be honest with you. There's some things that you're going to have to improve about the alerting and the reporting and what we'll need for this. But there's nobody else out there that's built something like what you've built. And I said, well, tell me more. And he goes, look, everyone else is $35,000, $40,000 for a site survey to come look at my spaces. Then they want to design a solution. And that means that that's going to be another thirty-five dollars to $40,000 of professional services right. so they can tell me where the sensors need to go. And then I have specialty installers that need to come in and plug in all the cabling and wire this up. He goes, it is a three to four month project for one campus and I've got 80 of them. Mm. So I'll never do it. And I said, okay, well, that, that starts to paint the picture a little more clearly. And he said, well, and it's not just that. He goes, then I have to have servers and then I have to feed and water and maintain those servers. And I got software instances at every campus that I have to link together and somehow get that data to the cloud. And we're not just one organization. We're hundreds of organizations with different access and different control. And so it's really complicated. But this takes all that complexity away because I can just stick a camera up and I can grab a bunch of sensors mm -hmm. and I can just push the button and they'll work. And I said, well, sounds great. Let's do it. So the project that would have taken them three months to roll out at their main campus here in London, they were able to deploy within two days. You know what is interesting is that I've never seen Meraki move and mobilize so fast to solve a major problem our customers have. Within mere months, we already had a working solution that allowed the customer not just to be able to see when their sensors were outside of temperature range, but to holistically look at all of their sensors in all of their spaces and identify if they're adhering to the ASHRAE set of standards. And that's built directly into the Meraki dashboard out of the box. Mm -hmm. They didn't even need third-party software or a third party to come in and manage it all for them. But since they've deployed their locations and they're rolling out now, what they're finding is they're collecting a vast amount of information. And so they've been working jointly with Google and their analytics team to apply even further machine learning and automation to the data that's coming from all of this sensor information. And so now they're not just putting human eyes on it when a sensor runs out of range, they're adjusting. No, they've got all of this big data being fed in and crunched to help solve their energy challenges. And it's not just cost savings, sure. 30%-ish cost savings is what they're realizing, and that's valuable for them. Mm -hmm. And in countries like the UK or France, 
that's really all they can talk about because they use clean energy sources. But when they started to look at this project and driving 30% energy savings in their IT stack in India and East Asia, where you have primarily coal fire power, well, it's a massive reduction to their carbon footprint and the offsets that they need to buy to get to net zero. And so like for them, the project paid for itself across all of their campuses commercially just on the energy savings within about eight months wow. of energy savings. Wow. But when you factor in the carbon savings, it's much more along the lines of four and a half to five months as they scaled this out. And then from that point on, now they have visibility. They have the ability to deploy new services on top of the sensor data. So they know exactly what's going on in all their spaces. And as we add new sensors to the portfolio and grow the capability, well, for them, it's as simple as just taking them out of the box and pushing the button. And now you have different data in the cloud. And I think that's the real exciting part for our customers is that we are just getting started on this IoT mm -hmm. journey. Mm -hmm. We are just at the beginning of leveraging cameras and sensors together to create a true smart space. That's an amazing story. And uh, I loved, I mean, what, what I loved about what I heard there was a, a sort of a democratization, essentially. Uh, you, you know, you started off by saying that, you know, this company was resisting uh, or finding it difficult to know where to start with this project because all the existing ways of, go of going about doing this just get way too complicated, way too expensive, and it's just a deterrent. I mean, people just don't have the time in their busy lives to, to sort of bring all that stuff in and, frankly, to get the budget to pay for it in many cases as well. The idea that we can... Uh, you know, put the power into the customer's hands with a turnkey solution, essentially. It's what we're talking about. I mean, that's that's hugely powerful. Um, I, I love as well that uh, that it was the customer who brought us uh, this sort of ashray and talked to us about that and and introduced that themselves. So it's it's clearly made an impact, uh, you know, globally as a as a standard. So clearly, it's a good reference to go and check out, um, as David was saying earlier on as well. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for that, Joe. Um, Leo, tell us a little bit about uh, you know what was learned at Bedfont Lakes as you were going through this this project and sort of how how you know how it's progressing, how that's going now. So some of the the key learnings. Uh, there's a lot of learnings that Joe just mentioned with, with the customer. And I think it was really exciting because actually we had a journey together <laughs> to some extent, you know, that this mm -hmm. customer asked Cisco, at least the project that we, we were uh, we are running uh, in Bedford. And this is actually the type of learning is in, in, in the fact that we actually have no visibility and the access to the data and we just get started. You know, a lot of the data, a lot of discovery we've done at Bedford has helped us shaping the dashboard that you guys are seeing today in order how to holistically see all the data that actually the sensors are, are providing. And what's also very interesting, and, and, and again, there's so many parallels that we are doing with uh, that uh, specific customer, is that now it has we got a lot of uh, traction internally within Cisco where we want to start, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, pushing this technology across all our data centers all across the world uh, in a way that we can actually start providing cost reduction and really understanding. And I think this is really something that comes to all the discussion I'm having uh, with, with my colleagues across the data centers, it's just visibility and the ease of use. Uh, and I think if you don't have the visibility, you don't really know what the best practices you need to mm -hmm. uh, apply. Do I need to put a curtain or do I need to change the, the fan speed? Do I need to open the door? Do I need to close the door? Or do I need to do something in winter? And I think this is really something that comes up uh, all the time. And I think that the, 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 the visibility part is definitely the big takeaway for us at Cisco that we actually have now the visibility within our data center. Uh, and I think that's actually a great, uh, a great result. You know, one of the other things to add on to that, Leo, that's really made this transition easy for our teams internally at Cisco and for our customers is, is the cybersecurity that we put into our sensors, right? One of the challenges you always hear about in the industry is a fish tank thermometer that compromises a, 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 mm. a casino. A uh, HVAC system that compromises a large retailer and billions of dollars of loss, right? And these trends keep happening over and over again of IoT devices or smart cameras that live on a network in a trusted part of the network. 
and then they create compromises from a security standpoint. And so as we architected our smart cameras and our sensors, one of the things that we do at Cisco is we look at how do we make our product cyber secure out of the box. And so when a customer takes a Meraki sensor or a Meraki camera into their environment, it's encrypted end to end. All of the firmware is mm -hmm. delivered and managed securely from the cloud. It's all digitally signed by Cisco. It turns out we invented most of that technology. And I think that's the most compelling part about this is when you're in the cybersecurity space, well, you know how to deliver products that are trusted and reliable. And that really is the difference for a lot of our customers that have thought about being able to do this. And then they say, oh, I don't know, like, I can't just go put sensors on my network. I, like, what happens if, right? And so that's a barrier. What happens if something were to happen? That's my job, right? And uh, I know there's, there's always a funny expression in the IT industry, which is no one ever got fired for buying Cisco. Hmm. And that's just the truth, right? When you, buy, when you build products for 30 years that are they're reliable and secure, like this is... This is why we got into this space, to really help our customers solve these problems so they can focus on their mission. I'm so glad that you uh, that you brought that up again, Joe, because we we you know we've been talking about this concept of of the secure connection to the cloud management uh, infrastructure that supports all of this for so long now that that frankly it's easy to take it for granted. You forget about it, but you're absolutely right. The advent of new types of devices that start popping up in people's environments and on their tr in the trusted part of their network, these IoT devices. They are, you know, in some cases, quite dubious in terms of how they operate. Like it's quite murky. You don't really know uh, what that thing is doing when you plug it in. So, you know, having this uh, be part of what is already an established best practice in this industry around connecting these devices back to the cloud, absolutely fundamental. I think that's a very important uh, important point there. All right, I think we sort of start moving things towards a conclusion. I mean, this is such a, an interesting one. I never thought when I hit the record button that I'd be learning about the uh, the practical uses of plastic curtains uh, in uh, in data centers. That was a new one on me, I must admit. So proof that it's, it's, uh, it's worth tuning into these podcast episodes. You learn something new every single time. Um, David, from from if you think about your uh, your white paper you produced, um, let's just talk about that a little bit. You, you've uh, you wanted to capture obviously a lot of this to try and help uh, customers who are starting on that journey. That's what I'm interested in here. Is you know where where can people sort of learn a little bit more if they're interested in following a path like this? Yeah. So based off of the conversations that we've had with our customers, with the best practices that we've been implementing at the Bedfont Lakes data centers from industry reports, we've kind of gathered a lot of this information and tried to distill it down into a easily digestible white paper that IT leaders can follow to implement some of these best practices inside data centers of their own. Um, and so we have a white paper available. If you go onto the Meraki website, uh, meraki.com forward slash sensors, Scroll, you know, halfway down the page, there's a, uh, a list of resources right there. The white paper is easily findable um, in that group of resources. Uh, I believe it's titled Six Ways That IT Leaders Can Reduce Their Carbon Footprint. Um, so highly recommend to check it out. Um, it's, it's not too long. It's not too overly complicated. And it really tries to outline uh, some of these best practices and then also put some kind of data behind it. So, for example, free cooling can reduce energy costs up to 60%, and here's how you can go about it. Uh, so it's a great resource for anyone who's looking to um, try to improve the sustainability of their organization by reducing the, the energy costs and, and carbon emissions inside their data centers. All right. We have the resources to help with this as well. Um, gentlemen, I want to thank you all so much uh, for, for joining this conversation. We've uh, It seems like the time has flown by super fast, uh, but we've actually touched on, I think, all of all the points we really wanted to. I mean, it's, it's very clear that uh, as we've done with many uh, areas of technology, we've removed devices that you don't need, and we've made it much easier for you to go about set, sort of supporting yourself and getting this equipment uh, helping your bottom line as well as your sustainability objectives in this case. So 
pretty nice story and uh, super happy to share it with you. I definitely recommend, as David said, go check out that uh, that white paper, meraki.com forward slash sensors. You will find it. And if you want to carry on the conversation, you know how to do so. Um, easy to find us online. Um, obviously, we have the Meraki community at uh, community.meraki.com. And also, uh, please do, as I said at the beginning, reach out with some ideas, your feedback uh, on Twitter at Meraki Simon. We'd love to hear from you, as always. We'll be back in a couple of weeks. Uh, gentlemen, thanks a lot for, for joining us once again, each of you. Thanks for Thank you. Us. Thank you. All right, we'll be back soon. Um, thank you very much, everybody, and uh, take care. We'll be back in two weeks. Bye for now.